You know, one second, here we go. Our agenda for this evening is pretty straightforward. I just have a couple of opening remarks. Then we, uh, we actually received just over 1,300 questions after the form went out, I believe, on Tuesday. So thank you very, very much for our, from our community. Uh, about 500 people asked in total about 1,300 questions. We appreciate that. We took those questions and categorized them and then uh, uh, took out uh, repetitions, and we will take some time to answer all of those previously submitted questions. And then once we get through that, we'll have time. And the link you went to that was sent to you yesterday uh, for me is uh, brings you to where you're probably viewing now. And down below on the screen, there's an opportunity for you to type in questions. Uh, I'd ask that you watch and listen uh, to the answers we provide now. And if something wasn't covered, uh, please feel free to add that in and we'll be able to see it in real time and uh, answer uh, many of those questions too. And then I just have a very brief closing remarks. Uh, my opening remarks is really a thank you. Thank you to this community. Uh, COVID-19, the pandemic that we're dealing with is something nobody planned for. Uh, no school board, no administrator, no teacher, and definitely not a parent or student. Um, and how we get through this is working together. It's not always gonna be perfect and it certainly isn't going to be seamless. But if we work together as partners, we can do what's ultimately best for our students and our families, our staff and our entire community. Um, the reopening process has been going on for a while. We were promised reopening guidance in June. Instead, it arrived halfway through July. Um, when we received that guidance, it took a week for the guidance to come through from the governor, the Department of Health uh, statewide, and also the New York State Education Department. Since the time we received guidance, all schools have received updated and modified guidance along the way, feeling like every time we get one step forward, something pulls us back. But we're continuing to be absolutely committed to meeting or exceeding all of the guidance, especially that from the Department of Health. Um, I really just wanna say a quick thank you to our Board of Education, as well as our administration team, our teachers, faculty, and entire staff, who've worked tirelessly this summer and continuing to, to make sure that our process meets all of the guidance and uh, truly puts students first. I also wanted to just remind folks that with our reopening process, we obviously could not bring 4,500 uh, community members together or parents together. Um, we really needed to work through a process. So for that parent feedback, I just want to say thank you very much to our parent organizations, our PTAs, PTO, PACE, and SEPTA, who worked with me since closing every Monday night meeting. They sent surveys out to their buildings. They talked to people in their buildings. They brought back feedback, questions, concerns, and they have been uh, extremely uh, extremely important in this reopening process of being the, the voice of parents. And so moving forward, parents, if you aren't involved in the PTA, I'd encourage you to reach out and, and join the PTAs in SEPTA and PACE in your buildings. Um, and their voice is critically important. And uh, what we'll do now is we'll start with some questions. They're in categories. The first really focused on health and safety as well as overall questions. I'll also talk about transportation and then our instructional models, specifically first the virtual model and then the um, hybrid model. And then we have some general questions that don't necessarily fit into those categories. Right off the bat uh, with health and safety, the questions are, are the children expected to be tested when school begins? And on the same tone, are teachers and staff to be tested before school opens? And the answer to this is no. Um, the Everything that really comes down for us in terms of COVID testing is going to be from the Department of Health. And we work very, very closely with Dr. Mendoza and the entire Monroe County Department of Health. So as of now, there is not guidance or requirements that students or staff be tested for COVID before returning to school. I understand that question because many colleges are requiring that, but at this point, that is not a requirement and not something that the Penfield Central School District is doing. Um, what will the COVID protocols for students, uh, what will the COVID-19 protocol for students follow while attending school and will they have temperature checks? So we'll start with temperature checks. It is a requirement that students um, have their temperature 
um, checked every day, and then regularly answer what we refer to as the COVID-19 wellness questions. If you've ever been anywhere like a hairstylist or a barber, they ask you the same set of questions and many employers do that. So I just wanna talk quickly about staff. Staff will be using an app called Frontline and they will have to answer the wellness check questions and their temperature every day through that app. For students, the guidance from the State Department of Health and our Monroe County Department of Health is very, very clear that schools cannot do this alone and they need to partner with parents and guardians. So our students, parents will be completing the same app that our teachers and staff are completing. It will be through a company called Frontline that we use a lot already. More information of this app will come out later as we get a little closer to school. It's very simple. You go in, you check um, a yes or no for each of the wellness questions and then mark if you have a temperature or not. If you answer yes to any of those questions or the temperature of your child is above 100.4, then you need to keep your child home that day. And trying to do this at school, we will have lines out the door. So this is consistent with the rest of Monroe County school districts that will be using apps to work with our parents to make sure that those get completed. If a parent or guardian doesn't complete that, um, our principals and building level will be able to notify which kids did not will need a temperature check, and those students most likely will be pulled out of class to have their temperature uh, taken. Since our students in school, most of them will be in a hybrid model, I just can't encourage enough parents to please complete that app. Once you get it, you'll understand it, we'll talk through it, um, but we, we wanna obviously make sure that students are in class as much as possible and not being pulled out for temperature checks. Uh, the protocol students have to follow really is, um, we'll get in a little bit more when we talk about masking. So the, a lot of the questions that I have as well are, if a COVID positive case happens in children or teachers, how will we address that? And can you explain what will happen if a student or teacher tests positive? So the best analogy I heard today from one of our administrators that I will borrow is this is very similar um, to when we have to call the fire department because of an issue in our school. When the fire department shows up, the fire chief becomes the person in charge and will tell us if we have to leave the building or we can stay in the building. The same is true for the Department of Health. So when there is a case, a positive case, we will be contacted by the Department of Health because all COVID tests go through the Department of Health. They know who in our community has tested positive. So uh, the Department of Health is a great partner. They have all of our daytime phone numbers for our nurses and they have a 24 hour number for all of our building administrators and myself. So if there is a after hours test of one of our students or staff, we should receive a call from the Department of Health. If we hear a rumor that somebody has tested positive, we will call the Department of Health to verify that information. At that point, the Department of Health will work with us to determine what are the next steps regarding who needs to quarantine, if a class needs to go home, or ultimately if a school needs to be closed. So while I wanna be able to give you an exact answer for every time there's a positive test, I wanna give you the honest and transparent answer is that it really depends on what the guidance from the Department of Health is. They are the experts when it comes to COVID and we will listen to and follow their mandates 100%. So a lot of that goes along with the quarantine concept. We've all heard about it. If you have been exposed, you need to quarantine. How long is that quarantine for? Would they need to be tested before they return to school? Would they need clearance from their doctor? Does a class, a building, a district need to shut down? Will the parents be notified? And what is our contact tracing plan? I'll start with the contact tracing plan. Our plan is to be working very closely with the Department of Health. So if there is a student or a staff member who tests positive for COVID, the Department of Health will reach out to us to help them with contact tracing. So if a student tests positive for COVID, we will be able to give the Department of Health the class lists in the bus roster for that student. So the Department of Health can more quickly work through contact tracing to determine what level of um, connection the positive case had with other individuals and work through what individuals do need to quarantine. So if a student or a teacher in class does test positive, it's very possible the Department of Health will recommend that we quarantine that group for 10 to 14 days. 
And so we will then be notifying first those students and teacher that they will need to quarantine. And then we will put out information um, that there was a positive test. And there's actually a past practice with this. If you're a parent and you've had children in school, you've gotten the letter when a case of pertussis or strep throat um, has been found in your child's class. Under HIPAA law, we can't tell you who tested positive, but just that somebody did test positive. Again, same with strep throat and pertussis. But um, if we have most likely, it will not lead, one case of COVID will most likely not lead to the entire school having to close. It will be because of contact tracing, it will be potentially one class um, and they would have to be home and we would work with them to then shift from a hybrid model to virtual instruction until they can return to school. Does a student or teacher need or staff member need to be tested for COVID before returning? If a student or teacher or faculty or staff member is sent home because of COVID symptoms, they will need to see their doctor they cannot return to school until the symptoms have gone away and the doctor has cleared them because maybe it is a, a documented medical situation. So if a student has a documented very bad seasonal allergies and therefore they get a really bad runny nose, watery eyes, maybe even lose a little taste, if the doctor can say, this, is, this, is, this happens all the time, they will probably be able to come back with that doctor's letter. However, the Department of Health will be contacted and they may mandate that the student or teacher get a COVID test before they re run, uh, return to school. It is very fair to say with everything, the guidance is changing on a regular basis. And so if between now and the opening of school, the Department of Health requires people to get a COVID test before returning to work or school, we will follow that and we will share that out through our communication methods to all of our families and students. So that's where I talk here, if a student is sent home from uh, with COVID symptoms, how do they get back to school? Sometimes it may be a doctor's note based on the medical condition or the situation. Other times it may be a COVID test and that really will come down to the, to the pediatrician or physician and the Monroe County Department of Health of what they require. Um, given that a significant proportion of, of COVID-19 folks are asymptomatic, how are temperature screenings and attestations going to keep the virus out of schools? I think it's fair and transparent to say there is nothing we can do to truly keep a virus out of schools. We know that flu season hit schools really hard because of the number of people here. But the, re the reason we have to do temperature checks with partnerships with parents and the reason that we have to do the COVID wellness questions is because honestly, it is a requirement from the State Department of Health and the Monroe County Department of Health and the governor's office. That's why we're doing it, but also because it helps keep people home who are sick, whether it's COVID or not, if they have to answer yes to those questions or have a temperature over 100.4, staying home will help. It will decrease the possibility that the virus can come into our school building. Our teachers and staff receiving extra training regarding how to identify and help students who are struggling with emotional mental health due to COVID. First, as part of the requirement, all of our staff is receiving information on how to, the signs and symptoms of COVID, so they can be knowledgeable and keeping an eye out for. In regards to helping students struggling with the emotional and mental health that comes along with living in a pandemic, absolutely. This district, and I have to say a huge shout out to our Board of Education, thank you so much because they have been committed to the social emotional learning of our students long before it became a buzzword. We've talked about the the development of the whole student and trying to say it's not just about academics, but it's about everything that encompasses really being a productive citizen. And part of that is our social and emotional health. And so yes, our teachers are gonna be working with students, our counselors especially, our mental health team, our administration, and making sure that we can try to make things as normal as possible in a world that's gonna look very different come September, 2020. What type of changes have been made uh, with the HVAC filtration in order to meet the New York State Department of Health guidelines and have these guidelines been modified to address COVID? And will there be plexiglass shields covering the student's desks? I'm gonna answer the second question around plexiglass covering the student's desk. And the answer there is almost uh, uh, always no. 
There will possibly be some areas, especially in some of our special classes where there may be some use of plexiglass, but in order to uh, make our classrooms as inviting as possible, we are therefore mandating masks at all times and six foot distance at all times in the classroom. And uh, we won't see plexiglass throughout of all, all of our classrooms. I will phone a friend right now and ask Mr. McNiff, our director of facilities, if he could touch base on our HVAC filtration systems in our, in our classrooms and buildings. Sure, thank you, Dr. Putnam. Uh, the first thing I want to mention is that all of our HVAC systems, uh, you have to keep in mind, uh, go through the process during the process of design and construction uh, to be approved by the New York State uh, Office of Facilities Planning through SED. So uh, what we have in place meets, uh, meets and exceeds the requirements that they have and the filtration uh, that they require for our buildings. What we're doing to increase that, uh, the level of um, quality of air, if you will, is to increase the outside air intake to uh, those pieces of equipment. So traditionally, we have a portion of outside air that comes in through the, um, the mechanical piece of equipment and into the classroom. And there's a portion that comes from the classroom that gets refed through the piece of equipment uh, and, and filtered back into the room. Um, to try to attain the most uh, effectiveness for ventilation, we're increasing the outside air percentage significantly as much as we can to still, but yet still allow that piece of equipment to provide either the heating or the air conditioning for that space. So we're going to modulate that with our um, control system to give us the most effectiveness uh, that we can for the space. Additionally, like we do every year, uh, we're in the process of cleaning all of our pieces of equipment just prior to the start of school and inserting brand new filters in every piece of equipment. Thank you, Alan. This question came up a couple times, and I think it's a great one. What is the Board of Education's role with respect to COVID-19? The Board of Education uh, truly oversees all of the public school of Penfield Central School District. And so um, as superintendent and the district office administrators, we work very closely with the school board. To be fair in, re in respect to COVID-19, none of the plans so far have had to been board approved. However, the board meets with me regularly, both through Zoom and in person and through lots of email communication in order to be up to speed and make sure that they are supportive of the work that we're doing. They've read the guidance, they understand what our schools are faced with with COVID, and they've been extremely supportive along the way. I also wanna be very fair, being supportive also means questioning the superintendent and wanting more answers, more detail, and, and making sure that all aspects have been, have been really thought through, and I appreciate that too. So the Board of Education has been very involved with being a partner through this with the school district. And uh, I'll just mention that while our meetings have been closed because of an executive order for the governor, um, Mr. Elledge, our board president, mentioned that we are very hopeful in September, we will back to be back to real meetings, allowing uh, community residents in. But in the meantime, the Board of Education is always open for email communication. Their email addresses um, are on our district website under the board tab. Some more questions. Uh, this really deals with masks. Uh, um, the plan change from masks being highly recommended to masks being mandated. Also that children uh, may not wear masks because of medical exemptions. And so we'll start with why the change. When we first put out our original tentative plan, it was masks in common areas and uh, recommended masks in classrooms. In between that and when we put out our official plan, the Monroe County Department of Health put out a document really saying that they are recommending masks at all times. It is better to be safe than, than not safe. So that is why uh, the Penfield Central School District and the vast majority of districts around us shifted to requiring masks at all times for all students, staff, and faculty. Um, children not wearing masks due to medical exemptions would be required to get COVID tests. No. Uh, right now they wouldn't, but um, there are certain medical reasons why a student can't wear a mask and they are, they're difficult to come by. To be fair, many of our students may have true medical issues, um, but lots of uh, reasons like uh, not wanting to or being uncomfortable wouldn't really fall into the level of a medical reason to get a doctor's note. 
we would review those medical notes with our district doctor, Dr. Tu, who works with our district, before just saying, um, approving a, a request to not wear a mask. Our hope, our goal, and our intention is to have the vast majority of our students wearing masks throughout the day. But because that's a lot of time for students, especially our youngest, to wear masks for such a long time, we're going to be incorporating mask breaks throughout the day. The mask breaks, at, especially at our elementary level, will be much more, um, much more scheduled, much more, much more thoughtful. Um, we can have a little bit of fun with this. This is the new norm, but we will make sure that students are six feet apart from each other and be able to uh, take their mask off for a break. There may be some areas in the classroom that are far away from everybody for a student who needs a mask break. We'll be trying to get outside as much as we can so students can remove their mask for a break. As we get to middle school and high school, while teachers will probably still be giving mask breaks officially, we'll also know that as students get more mature and they get a little bit more responsibility, they know that they can leave to go to the bathroom if they need to take their mask off for a minute, or they can do so in the classroom if the teacher gives permission. And all of that will be taught the first couple days of school. So students know when the mask breaks are allowed, how do they make sure they get their mask break. We understand as parents too how difficult this is, especially our youngest students wearing masks for a long time. But we also know that the resiliency of our students and the support of our parents has been, has been incredible and we will work through this to make sure everybody feels safe. Will students be um, required to wear a mask during PE, recess, choir, buses? The overall answer is yes, masks are all day. There will be times like during lunch when students are eating, they'll be six feet apart from each other. Obviously the mask comes off. There'll be some PE activities when they can be safely six feet apart from each other that the mask would come off. And we'll work through all those times that masks are allowed to come off uh, with our teachers and, and instruct students so they are, are aware along the way. Um, I sort of talked about this, the policy for masks on our youngest learners, what if they refuse to wear one? What if they just can't keep it on? Um, our youngest kids, we know. We know that we'll have to work with those students. We're gonna be providing some information to um, our teachers, but also to our families to help you um, learn how you can get your child to wear a mask if it's something they're not used to. And we do understand that many students may have never worn a mask because they haven't been out to a grocery store or anywhere yet, but we'll get that information out soon to help families work with their children about masks. Um, uh, uh, wearing glasses, having anxiety, sensory issues, same thing. We'll, we'll provide some information and work with families and students to help those students realize the importance of wearing masks and how that we can, um, we can work together as a team to make sure that they're wearing them so they can be in school. Will the school provide face masks and face shield? The school is providing, uh, two, will ultimately provide at least two masks to, to every uh, student and faculty and staff members. So we are ordering lots of those and we'll be able to hand those out. We're also encouraging families and staff members to bring their own mask. Um, there's some really fun ones out there. You can wear your own mask. Is there a mandate for which sort of mask can be worn? There isn't. In terms of the guidance, there's not a requirement of exactly what it has to look like. And right now we're allowing any face shield that covers your mouth and nose counts as a face mask. As guidance changes, that might be a change from the Department of Health and we would notify parents and faculty and staff on a change of what is required. Can you wear a face shield instead of a mask? That would be a question I would really talk with your physician about. If there is not, a, if you can't wear a mask and you want to wear a face shield because of a medical reason, that would be something you could talk with your doctor and we could work with our building nurses to, to verify. Um, how will it be enforced? We, we really look at this similar to the dress code. So it is the requirement. And right now, um, you know, we have dress codes and are able to enforce them for lots of different reasons. I don't see it any different with the mask. It will probably be a conversation with the student. It may then be a conversation with an administrator, ultimately a phone call home. And I don't wanna talk about discipline because we really are hopeful and just like with the dress code, we have uh, some uh, folks not follow it. And then working with parents as partners, uh, we get on the right track. So um, we will be working with families and students who refuse to wear one to make sure that they can. Um, if they don't, the question is, well, will they be forced to go to 
percent virtual. There is no policy on this, but I think it's fair to say that if a student refuses to wear one and there's not a medical issue, at some point it may be a conversation with the family about moving that child to the 100% virtual model will be able to offer. And this is really because of the requirements from the Department of Health and because of what we know about the virus and about being safe uh, for everybody, not just for me as an individual, but for everybody else in the room. Will paper towels be provided instead of hand dryers? Yes, we did such a great job environmentally adding hand dryers everywhere, and now we're not allowed to use hand dryers per the guidance, and so we will be putting up uh, paper towel dispensers in all of our restrooms again. What cleaning solutions are being used to sanitize the classrooms and buildings? I'll just say that everything we're using is, it has to be approved by, by New York State. Alan, could you uh, uh, talk a little bit about that, the cleaning solutions? Sure, uh, absolutely. Um, we actually have a, a, a couple of disinfectants that uh, we are going to be utilizing in our classrooms and throughout the buildings. Um, I could go into uh, hours of talking about this, but uh, we will have, uh, we have had um, uh, spraying equipment that we plan on utilizing uh, to spray the disinfectant uh, every evening on all classroom desks, tables, uh, any touch surfaces, essentially. And of course, our, of our main entrance is where we have lots of uh, gatherings of people if they come into the building. So, uh, like I said, we were also going to have the same, one of the two disinfectants in each of the classrooms. So a teacher will have it available to them at any point with a microfiber towel uh, so they can clean any surface as they need be throughout the course of instruction throughout the day. Thank you, Alan. Uh, specialized training on the custodial staff. Do we have enough custodians? Is the district hiring professional uh, companies? Alan, can you take that one too? Sure. We, we're not hiring any um, special companies. Uh, we have a process in which we've trained our staff on how to adequately do the cleaning that we are um, expected to do based upon the suggestions and guidance that we've been given. Um, our staff is very good at understanding what those responsibilities are and what we need to do. They also understand what the materials that we use uh, and how to appropriately use them. So we are in the process of just re-reviewing that with all of our staff. Um, uh, for those of you who are not aware, but we also have to keep logbooks of all of the areas that they are cleaning every night. So the areas that every staff member will have a, um, a, a book that has a spreadsheet on it and they'll identify the rooms that they cleaned, how they cleaned them and uh, what time they did it and so forth. So that we keep all that records, uh, keep all those records in the event that we do have someone that um, uh, does uh, have the COVID uh, illness that we're able to track down, do we clean, when's the last time we cleaned that space and have any other additional information that, they're, uh, that we've been required to um, have on hand, so. Thanks, Alan. Um, How's a room disinfected before the next group comes in? Uh, and we will be wiping them down with the products Alan talked about. It won't be students by, by the guidance. It has to be adults who do that. Um, if kids switch rooms, how will the cleaning of supplies be handled? You'll see when we get class lists up, especially for the K-5, there will be less sharing of supplies. Um, but when students come into the classroom and leave the classroom, we're gonna be asking them to use hand sanitizer in and hand sanitizer out because we do know that there's gonna be time students are gonna to touch something that was touched by a student in the previous class. We can't make school a bubble. We're gonna make it as safe as we possibly can and mitigate risk as best as we can and follow all the guidance. And that's why that, that proper cleanliness of washing hands with soap and water and using hand sanitizer and wearing masks and social distance is gonna be critically important. Um, what are the bus cleaning and safety practices? The buses and the same uh, token are gonna be right now really being built those routes around social distancing and masks are gonna have to be worn on the bus and then uh, they'll be cleaned down in between each run. So when the bus goes out to pick up people, it will be clean. When it drops them all off, it'll be wiped down again and then it'll be clean when it goes out. So we're gonna be uh, continuing to clean our buses uh, on a regular basis uh, to keep things safe, similar to the classroom. In the evening for classrooms, we'll do we'll do a deeper clean. We'll make sure we sanitize with all the products that Mr. McNiff talked about. Transportation. So transportation questions. If you choose busing, but then need to change uh, to parent pickup later on or the other way around, is that okay? And if you choose to drive your child to and from school, will they be able to ride the bus on occasion if need be? 
And the answer to both of those is yes. We asked the question in the survey about transportation really for our internal needs so we can try to make sure that we, our routes are socially distant. And they will be, especially because of the hybrid model, only half the students coming to school um, each day. And so we are gonna route every student um, like they need of us, even if they're not being picked up. And this is exactly why we know that uh, family lives change, work hours change, and even though you, your hope is to drive them every day, ultimately you might need to use the bus, and that's okay. That's why when we do uh, put out the bus routes, you'll be able to go to Infinite Campus and see the pickup location and time, the same with drop off for your child. Um, if you can drive, great. If you need to change the bus, no problem. We have built that in for you. Uh, what will the drop off and pickup times for parents be? Uh, what will the process be at each school? And so as we get a little bit closer, principals will be sharing in their back to school information exactly what the process will look like if it's any different. Um, the, uh, we really don't know exactly what it's gonna look like in terms of pickup and drop off. We know that all of our schools, it creates a traffic nightmare for parents dropping off their children and picking up along the buses and our local traffic. However, we know that because of hybrid, half of our students will be coming to school each day. And as of right now, about 10% of our students won't be coming at all because they're selecting the virtual model. And so we're gonna let the first two days of school, September 10th and 11th go, and then work on if we need to change drop off or pick up times, locations, or process. And so bear with us, the first couple of days of school are always a little, um, a little hectic with drop off and pick up, but we're going to not make major changes yet because we wanna see exactly what it looks like. But again, specifics will come from your building principal as school gets a little closer. If kids need to be dropped off early, especially at middle school and high school, where can they go once the doors are open? Um, we'll, we'll allow students to go socially distant to the cafeteria, to the library. We'll let students know where those locations are, but, but we do know that sometimes students get to school a little bit before that first class opens up. And when dropping off kindergarten students, do the parents need to walk them into school and into the class? And the answer is no. Similar to a regular traditional year, parents drop off and then we take the students. We also know that like a typical year, we'll have some brand new kindergartners who are upset and might be emotional. And I can promise you as a dad who has to drop his little guy off at daycare every day, that um, once they turn the corner, 99.9% .9 of the time, they've forgotten all about you and they're excited to be in school. But parents do not need to walk their child into school. Um, will each school consider a staggered parent uh, pick up and drop off? It's possible. It's going to be monitored throughout the year, and we will update you clearly when changes need to be made in order of organization for the process of pick up and drop off. What's considered a reasonable about a, amount of time for a parent or student to be waiting during parent pickup? I wish I could tell you as a parent who's had to drop off and pick up my students sometime, uh, sometimes it, it can be a long wait really depends on traffic that day and how many people decide to pick up and drive. I would just ask, please be patient, especially the first few days of school um, as we work through the process to make sure that it can be as safe as possible. But if we're all safe, we all leave early, we all take our time, wear our seatbelts, uh, that's what we really ask you to do. How many students will be on each bus? Um, it, it really depends. So right now, the guidance has, has shifted with buses. It's not necessarily a 100% social distance. That would be one child every other seat, which would be 11 students on a large bus. That is not feasible for any school district. So the guidance therefore changed to say, everybody has to wear a mask on the bus at all times. It's really only one child per seat, which is about 22, but siblings and family members can sit together. So there are buses that, that might have about 30 students on that, but that would include siblings who are sitting together in a seat. Most buses will be around, around 25. Um, and that's being routed thinking everybody's riding a bus. And knowing that many parents will drive, we know that that number will go down. We'll be monitoring our bus routes as school starts. Um, how will transportation work for our urban suburban students? And will the high school still be provided the late bus which leaves at 2.50? Um, our urban suburban students are 100% are, are part of Penfield, and so their transportation comes from the Rochester City School District, and that will run regular. They'll run every single day, and um, students in the urban suburban program, just like all of our Penfield students, were uh, broken into two groups, and so their buses will have about half as many students on them. 
As of right now, I don't believe the late bus for urban suburban will be running or not running any late buses or having any after school activities or clubs in the beginning of the school year. That may change as the school year uh, progresses and hopefully COVID numbers go down and we can open up more fully. But for now, we are putting uh, safety as the number one precaution and there won't be late buses at all. Will there be transportation to EMCC programs such as New Vision? Yes, EMCC will still be running their programs and our buses do the transportation for that. Will large crowds of kids gather as they are walking to school or into school? Yes, we will still have large groups of kids because we only have a couple of entrances and we've got to get everybody through, which is why, again, masks are going to be required. And so we'll do our best to make sure that students are further apart. Um, I will tell you, though, whatever parents can do to help before they get to the building and before they get to school, it's still a, a, a little a while to go out in the community and see large groups of kids working very closely together with no masks. We can't control everything, but we encourage parents to have those important health conversations with their children. Now on to the information about the instructional models. Uh, I've got some slides on hybrid and I have some slides on um, uh, hybrid. I have some slides on remote. And I also have one slide here that's sort of an overarching question. And we get this a lot and it's a great question and I ask it too. Um, why is there no space to accommodate learning for five days a week? So all around us in this county, the public schools are on a hybrid model for high school. Most of them are on a hybrid model for middle school, but there are some districts that have five days a week for their K-5 students. And, and that's great. It all comes down to the fact that all of us as districts have to follow the mandated requirements from the State Department of Health and New York State Education Department. However, our buildings all look, look different. So for example, anybody who drives around know, now knows that we are building 12 elementary classrooms, four classrooms at three of our buildings for a total of 12. They won't be done this year. Uh, they'll be done hopefully for next September. So. We, if you have an elementary school student, know that we have repurposed just about every space in all of our elementary schools to make classrooms as class sizes grew larger because people are moving to Penfield. We didn't have room to, spit, to split classes in half. So the math I use, it, it helps because we really dug in this to a lot. And thanks to Alan McNiff, we looked at maps and drawings and, and determined that a typical elementary classroom can hold 12 students if they're six feet apart. And our typical elementary class size is about 24. So that would mean that all of our classrooms would have to be split in half and we would have to find basically 24 new classrooms in each school to be able to open uh, five days a week. It was a goal, we tried, we looked at it every way we could and at the end of the day, Penfield had to build classrooms because we don't have space anymore and COVID hit at a terrible time. If it hit next year when we had new classrooms, maybe we could do something a little bit different, but that's not the reality we live in right now. The other great question is, we got tons of open space. Let's just build structures, put up tents and, and go from there. It's really important to know that everything we do, even if we're gonna use a gym for a classroom, a gymnasium room for a classroom, all of it has to be cleared by New York State Education Department facilities and has to meet all of the air quality and all of the safety features. So just building a tent outside and say we're gonna teach in that would not meet the requirements for safety, for fire safety, for all of the, the safety issues that are required for a regular classroom. Even if we bring, and we looked at this when we were getting really tight a few years ago, even if we just bought a trailer and said, let's make that classroom into a trailer. Those costs, and I'll look at Alan if I got this number right. If I recall, they, they cost almost $900,000 or something. They're, they're quite expensive because they have to have all of the safety issues that a typical classroom would have. The air handlers, the walkways, the lighting. Um, and so it's not as easy as just uh, putting a tent up and saying we're going to teach class in there. And it's probably going to snow in October, so it might not work for that reason as well. So let's talk about the remote learning a little bit, the 100% virtual. If my child does 100% virtual, will it be to the same quality level of instruction that he is, that is expected of the students going to hybrid? And this, I will tell you, is our number one uh, criteria for building our virtual uh, program is that we want to make sure that the students in virtual are getting the same curriculum tied to the same standards with the same assessments that students in the hybrid model are. 
We want to make sure that our students who have to be home 100% of the time are getting the same level of education that students in the hybrid are and that all students across the district are. So 100% the answer there is yes. For the virtual model, will it be more than just Wednesday for direct contact with the teacher? Yes, and we'll talk a little bit more. Our plan has really evolved in the sense that we are looking at scheduling our virtual st students with a teacher who will be at school every day, but their job will be to only teach the virtual students. And we really wanna make sure we're still building that, but that's the what I'm gonna share tonight as new information is that if you are picking the 100% virtual, you will be assigned to a teacher who is teaching you virtually. Will teachers Zoom and teach in person at the same time? Teachers will not have students in front of them and trying to Zoom with students at home at the same time. Um, to be quite honest, it sounds great to say that. We've tried it with adults all summer with professional development. The technology isn't quite there to make that work like it does maybe in a, in a multi-billion dollar organization where sales reps are in a meeting and sales reps are online. Trying to have one teacher engaged real kids in front of them and students virtually through a computer. Um, it, it doesn't really stand up to strong engagement and making sure that students are getting their questions answered and truly having an opportunity to be part of the lesson, not just watching it from afar. And so that is not our plan now to zoom in. It is possible in some very small areas, like perhaps a resource room or a 12-1-3-1 class in a student's virtual, that might be possible if you're talking about just a couple of kids in real person and a student at home zooming in. That may be possible, but trying to do it with 24 students in two different locations is just not practical. And, and it would be nice to say, but I would also know that they would not be getting a, a good quality education. For virtual learning, will teachers have a class via Zoom? Absolutely. The teacher who's assigned virtual will be meeting with those students either through Zoom or Microsoft Teams, one of those two platforms which are approved by our district. With the 100% remote have the option for students to participate in math and reading RTI. This is especially important at the K-5 level. And I have to say, we're working on that. So right now, the goal is to have a teacher, certified teacher working virtually with those students. Um, and it's possible that we'll be able to, at the elementary level, then tie those students into the um, RTI the other two days of the week. Here is where we're trying to be as transparent and as open as possible. While that looks good and sounds good, this year it's gonna be a little different. The classroom teacher will teach the students for two days. The other two days, it will be our specialists, our literacy specialists, our math specialists, and our enrichment specialists who will be continuing the content. So they won't just be doing check-ins and review, they'll actually be doing a wonderful job teaching those students to keep moving them forward. And that takes a lot of planning, which will happen on Wednesdays with our teachers. If we have a virtual teacher, it, we, it would be a little bit difficult to make sure that virtual teacher students can also be on the exact same spot of the curriculum as the students who are in person. And so it's possible, but I also wanna make sure I'm always fair to not overpromise something. So at minimum, a student who picks virtual is gonna be assigned a virtual teacher who will be with them and teach virtually, be able to do things synchronously and asynchronously. And we are working on the possibility of also tying them into their building RTI K-5. Will 100% learn, what will 100% learner day look like? Will it be at home instruction? And we, like we were pro provided at the start of the pandemic. As a superintendent, as a parent, I will say, the spring was like, like I refer to as the emergency closing. It was all hands on deck. And please remember, all staff was required to be home. So we were trying to teach virtually with everybody um, at home and trying to get new tools in place. So it will not be like that. It'll be much more organized. So I can't tell you right now exactly what a learner's day will look like in the virtual, but I will tell you it will be scheduled. There will be live Zooms or Teams, there will be some synchronous learning. And so those schedules will be out just like our hybrid students will receive a schedule of what classes they go to on the in-person days. Our virtual students will also receive a schedule on when they're Zooming and when they need to be doing asynchronous work. For the fully remote elementary options, will kids be participating along with other hybrid students on Wednesdays or will they be in a separate group? 
Most likely, Wednesdays, our focus is on SEL connections, social emotional learning and teacher check-in. That will probably be with the virtual teacher because they know that the virtual teacher will know what has been taught, what questions to answer, and really helping students through SEL. We believe strongly that the hybrid students and the virtual students both are going to need SEL support, social emotional learning support but it might be a little different. If you're doing your entire school virtually and you're not getting out of the house, then your SEL needs might be a little different than someone who's able to come to school two days a week and maybe is out of the house more for other reasons. And so right now the focus will be on Wednesdays, they would be with the full-time virtual teacher. For the fully remote elementary option, roughly how much time will the children be expected to sit in front of a screen on a daily basis? And I'm gonna look at our elementary principals, but in conversations we've had for that K-5 level, we're looking at about two to three hours of, of online synchronous learning in a virtual world. And that might be broken up a little bit or we'll get a schedule together, but it's not gonna be uh, five and a half hours of staring at a computer. So it'll be about two to three hours, I think it's fair to plan for. How often will they be able to Zoom Q&A time with their teachers, the 100% virtual kids? who are assigned a virtual teacher will be able to do more Zoom than if we did it a different way. Um, so it's not just gonna be one little time slot. There'll be other times that they'll be able to see the teacher and ask questions. If multiple teachers schedule their Zoom times in overlap, overlapping blacks, what happens? That happened a lot in spring. That is not gonna happen in the fall. So our building principals are working right now to build schedules to make sure that students aren't being required to be in two Zooms at the same time. They'll be scheduled and, and the students will know and the parents will know the schedule um, for their online learning. For 100% virtual at the elementary level, are there set times for students to log in? Yes, there will be. We don't know what those are right now, but a schedule will be devised for each grade level, each teacher, each student, so they know when they have to log in ahead of time. Why can't the 100% virtual students get synchronous learning like the hybrid students? I think they can. So actually our plan is if we can assign a virtual teacher to work with our K-5 students and at six through 12 as well, that they will be able to have more synchronous time. Well, our focus right now is probably looking at similar to hybrid, 612. So our goal is that they will get two days of synchronous instruction and three days of um, asynchronous along with the day of check-in and uh, office hours. And so I'd like that to mirror the best it can. So at least we're really committed to two days synchronous and three days asynchronous, just like our hybrid kids will be working through. Will those 100% virtual learnings um, have daily sessions with the teacher via Zoom? The answer is it might not be daily, but absolutely throughout the week, more than just one time to check in. How many, uh, how will my children get materials during virtual learning? Uh, unlike the, the pandemic in the spring, our buildings are open, our staff will be reporting. So anything like a workbook or, or, or things that need to be printed, we'll be able to um, either mail them home if you can't come in or do drop off so you can come in and pick them up. Will kids have the same virtual teacher each, each week for consistency? The answer is yes. Our commitment is to find a way and we will to basically hire uh, some of our internal staff to be the virtual teachers K-5 and perhaps at 612, they, one of their preps might be a virtual lesson. So they will have a teacher that's assigned to them that they can do. It won't be a different teacher every day for K-5. At the high school level, it will be a different teacher simply because of how the content schedule works. You'll have a math teacher, an English teacher, a social studies teacher, if we, and the rest of our core course teachers. If we choose 100% remotely, how does the school district help to remain uh, children's emotional health? And that's gonna be our school counselors and our mental health team are still here. It's that parent partnership. If your child is struggling, reach out to their teacher, but also reach out to their mental health support, their school counselor and administration to make sure. We don't know what's happening at home all the time, but if you are partners with us and let us know, we will work diligently to make sure students are supported. Has there been any consideration for allowing the 100% virtual model students to participate in the already established three day per week virtual cycle? And this is really directed at K-5. The answer is yes, there is consideration. We're continuing to look at that, but what we're guaranteeing now is that there'll be a virtual teacher assigned to our virtual students. One of the ways I know a local district is looking at this is it really is basically a fourth uh, a fifth elementary school. We have four elementary schools and then we'll have a virtual academy for the students across the district who need the virtual option for a number of reasons. We will work 
to try to incorporate them into their homeschool as well, perhaps through the RTI process, but, but I can't guarantee that right now. And again, while answers aren't always loved, I will always be transparent and honest. For the virtual model, uh, will a suggested schedule be given to help parents and organize student work? Absolutely. Once those schedules are there, parents will know what the schedule is and when they need to Zoom and when they need to do asynchronous work. Will the virtual instruction be from actual teachers or just resources? It will be actual teachers. They will teach. They may give a link to go look at, but it won't just be a website of links that you have to, to do yourself. Does remote learning have to be done at a certain time? It depends. The synchronous learning, yes, they'll have to log in at a certain time in order to be with the class and hear the instruction. Um, but other things, asynchronous learning can be done at any time. If the children do 100% learning at home, will they be able to participate with their class online? The answer is yes, they'll be able to participate in their virtual class online. That's a guarantee. If virtual is asynchronous for high school, if a student needs help with homework or concepts that he doesn't uh, do, the teacher only has office hours on Wednesdays. We heard a lot in the spring about being able to contact teachers at a regular time, which is why we built in at the secondary level, the office hours on Wednesdays. However, teachers all have emails and teachers are gonna be using Teams and there's a team chat function where the teacher can ask, uh, the student can ask a question to the teacher through Teams. Um, so there's other ways to reach out and ask, but there'll be Zoom synchronous times that they can meet on Wednesday. What plan has been put in place for the 100% virtual learning regarding contact time with teachers? Are students able to join a live class from home and at least observe what's being taught? I answered this question a little bit earlier, which is that trying to have live students at home and live students in the classroom trying to work together is, is not a reality that we can make happen and know that we can do it well. So they'll be, they'll be in a virtual classroom with a, a Penfield teacher, certified teacher supporting their needs. What kind of instruction will parents be given on how to help assist their children at home with virtual learning? Um, a lot right now, our professional development office is putting together some online learning opportunities for parents and guardians to learn how to access Teams, how to uh, work through our approved platforms, and we'll be sharing that out as school gets a little bit closer. Will the kids in 100% virtual be grouped with kids in their greater school, or will it be a combination of all elementary schools? Right now, based on the numbers we're looking at, it will not be the virtual classrooms will include students from all four elementary schools. Um, and, and we can still make that fun. Now, I understand being in Penfield that we love our elementary schools. And I, it's one of the reasons I moved to Penfield. And, and but in this world with the virtual learning, um, it's gonna be important to know that our students at the elementary level will be grouped virtually with students from across because we have about 10% of our students K-12 picking virtual. And so it's not enough at each grade level to have their own class. Um, if we do get that many people in virtual, we can shift and maybe it will be a teacher from your school teaching. But right now our numbers are aligning pretty well with the fact of needing a grade level teacher K through five to teach the students virtually from across the district. We're also gonna make sure that we'll, we'll be doing, when we do this, and this is new even for some of our principals to hear this from me because we literally just finalized this, is that we'll be doing an internal um, um, application to have te current teachers um, apply for that. So it'll also be somebody who uh, knows that they're gonna be teaching virtual K-5, that they know the, the platforms, they know how to work through teams and they're accepting that responsibility. And I think it can be, it, it will be again, the same curriculum, same standards, and we'll make sure that the virtual students don't miss out on anything that our hybrid students receive academically. Um, will the 100% remote students have set times to sign on for class? Yes, and those schedules will come out as we get closer. Will 100% online learners get any live interaction with their teacher? Absolutely. Um, how will the 100% virtual kids have a connected experience to their class in school, especially if we're able to go back to the classroom more often? My hope and everybody's hope is that the guidance lightens up because COVID uh, takes a back seat and we're able to get back to school fully. And if we do that, if we're able to go back to school fully, let's say in 10 weeks, then we wouldn't necessarily need a virtual teacher, but we'd leave that option open because some students may want to finish the year that way. But if we have to, we bring students back in and put them into a regular class um, along the way. 
Will the students that are 100% virtual have any opportunity to interact, present, participate with in-school students thinking of presentations or speeches? I would say very real possibility. And as we get started in the school year, being able to give time for teachers to collaborate, that's something that we'll be looking at. For 100% virtual, will there be additional homework in addition to the two to three hours of school work to be accomplished? I think I would say yes. And I think it would follow the same standard we do now in elementary school, which the lower primary grades don't get too much homework. As you get to third, fourth, and fifth, it's a little bit of homework, uh, but we're working with our staff and we'll continue like we did in spring to make sure that they're not on their computer all day doing schoolwork and homework. For the full remote elementary option, are the synchronous Wednesday act activities mandatory? So for all of our students, hybrid or virtual, when you have to log on, I don't love the word mandatory, but it's mandatory. Just like coming to school on a Wednesday in a traditional world is mandatory. So yes, if a student is ill and can't log on, the parent would call in that they were sick and we would monitor that through attendance. But yes, uh, when we have scheduled Zooms and scheduled uh, team meetings, uh, it would be a requirement just like school. If a child starts I want to go back to this question quickly. For K-5, when it is required, um, we do know at K-5 that not all students are going to be able to log on if their parents are working from home or their parents are uh, have them maybe in a daycare setting that they can't access uh, the computer. And so in those cases, we will be taping the lesson and putting it up online so parents can help their children later that evening watch it. But it would still be mandatory to go in and watch it because that's how we're taking attendance. We're taking attendance through Microsoft Office Teams and your, uh, every time you log in and submit something, it'll take attendance. And so I think I, I think I answered that one. If not, email me and I'll, I'll keep uh, answering your questions. If a child starts off 100% virtual in January and decides, uh, and, and then in January decides to change, how will we do that? Um, in the winter, we will make a similar um, form to see if you want to stay virtual or hybrid or shift, and then we will have to uh, arrange schedules. So if you go from virtual to hybrid, we would have to assign you a classroom teacher that's teaching hybrid. Will virtual kids get uh, worksheets, books? We talked about this. Absolutely. You'll be able to pick them up. We'll be able to mail them if you're not able to come into the building for some reason. How about students with an IEP? Um, we will be uh, uh, meeting the needs of all of our IEPs. Mr. Dreschler, our director of special education, was unable to be on this Zoom now, um, but they're working through that. And we actually have three meetings for grade levels coming out um, next week. For, for parents of students with disabilities. So we can talk specifically about those needs and what, we're, what our plan is to support all learning. Will certified teachers teach the virtual classes? Absolutely. Just so you know, when the guidance changed, they didn't give us much other guidance except that ver uh, certified teachers have to be the ones teaching, which is great. And that's our focus always is our certified teachers are the ones uh, teaching both in school and virtually. Will the kids have the same virtual teacher each week? Yes. Will schools... Um, got some of these questions, making sure. If who's 100% remote, how does the school district help to remain emotional health? I think I realized that this, this might be a question we already went through. I apologize. We, as I said, we got 1,300 questions and we were putting those, putting these together all the way up until time. So what teachers will be doing the 100% virtual option? I don't have a list of names to tell you now, but I can tell you that as we go through that process, they will be Penfield Central School District staff. Um, will all students doing 100% remote learning be working on the same content? Yes, if everybody's in the virtual world for fourth grade, those virtual students will all be working on the content together and it will be the same content curriculum that's being happening in the classroom. It might not, might not always be lockstep that a virtual student is learning the exact same thing that a hybrid student is learning on the same day, but the curriculum mapping is still the same and they will get everything that a hybrid student gets and vice versa. So hybrid. Some questions now on hybrid. Could you describe an average day for our students at the elementary, middle, and high school level? And this is where finally I get to take a little bit of break. So I have got, we'll start with the high school, and I believe I have Dr. Maloney on the line. Um, she may have stepped away because I don't see her face. Can we start with Mr. Herschler 
I think I see you. Could you just give a little bit of, of what a day looks like on the in-school days for a K-5 to student? Sure. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's not going to look totally different than it does now, aside from the masks. Uh, we're going to have our core content uh, areas uh, all set. We also will providing specials on those days for students who are in person. Our lunches will be different. They'll be delivered in the classroom instead of uh, in the cafeteria for social distancing reasons. Um, and we're gonna do our best as far as dismissal from buses and back on buses to help stagger that so that they're not all coming in at the same time. Uh, but again, uh, it's not gonna look a lot different than what we have now, except for the social distancing, less desks and classrooms, so on and so forth. And I'll let Mr. Nelson pick it up from there. I was actually just saying goodbye to my uh, administrative assistant. I wasn't waving, but that's okay. Um, I just to echo it that, that what we're most excited about is that we're gonna have a lot of time with our kids while they're here, more than what we're used to from an uninterrupted standpoint. Uh, the, the RTI model will be virtual. So our classroom teachers are going to have three hours four hours of, of time in the classroom with 10, 11, 12 students, which is what I, you know, there's a lot of negatives. This is a positive to, to, to be able to individualize, differentiate and meet the needs and know our students. Uh, we're going to have big chunks of time. So I just want to highlight some of the positives. Thanks. Uh, thank both of you. And I'll, I'll turn to Mr. Bunnington. Can you give us a little day in the life of a middle school student on the hybrid in-person days? So certainly, Dr. Putnam, thank you. One of the biggest changes for all of our middle school students is that in order to have a consistent schedule, we've had to change our schedule to an eight period day, 40 minute periods, more of what we think of as a traditional schedule. It ends up being a, essentially a day one and day two schedule. Core classes will meet at the same time every day on day one or day two. So a student coming in in group A, first period, would have might have English first period on day one. They're also going to have English first period on day two. In our specials blocks, student might have PE on day one and then art class on day two. All our classes are 40 minutes. We've also in our schedule been able to add a second lunch for each grade level. So we will have students eating in two different groupings per grade level for lunch. Um, in our cafeteria, we're taking out the cafeteria tables and we'll be setting up desks in the cafeteria where students will actually be eating lunch because we've taken desks out of the classroom. So in each classroom, there's only gonna be 13 desks. We'll be using those in the cafeteria to have our students space six feet apart in the cafeteria. Um, so as students progress through their day, they will, it's an eight period day, but they'll have five core classes They'll have two special area classes and then they'll have lunch and home base. The other change we've done to facilitate the two lunches is we'll back up, home base is backed up to lunch. So for the first half hour, some students may be going to lunch and some students will be in home base of that time period. The second half hour of that middle part of the day for the grade level, they'll flip flop. The students that started in home base will go to lunch and vice versa. Our student day is still, we'll start announcements at 8.05. We'll start dismissal at 2.40. For parents looking to drop students off, as has been in the past, our, our building will be open beginning at 7.15. Students coming in at that time would be asked to go to the library. They'll be monitored in the library and then about 7.45, we'll dismiss them to, to go to their classes. Another big change for middle school students is that we're not going to be assigning lockers to start the year. Students will be able to carry backpacks throughout the year. Um, there's a lot of anxiety often for students around lockers, especially our incoming sixth graders. We don't have that opportunity to be with them and help them through that this summer. So as we get into October, we will then be assigning lockers to students. But to start the year, students can carry backpacks all year. We've minimized our list of supplies for students. Um, and we posted those lists on the Bay Trail website along with answers to parent questions. So hopefully those parent, those help. Um, that's the general 
quick overview of what a day in the life of a hybrid middle school student will look like. Thank you, Benton. Um, Dr. Maloney? So a day in the life of a PHS high school hybrid student, um, our schedule is not changing, so we will still have the nine period day. Obviously there will be half the students here and they will have masks on. The classrooms are being set up to be socially distanced. So um, desks will be spread out and uh, to meet the guidelines. As at Bay Trail, our lunches, uh, lunches will still be the same time. In the cafeteria, students will be eating um, at desks in order to be able to safely socially distance students. Um, in terms of things that might look different, um, as Mr. Bunnington shared, we actually uh, have discovered through the closure that many high school students don't take advantage and don't use a locker. So at the high school, we will be running a request system where if a student wants a locker, they will um, have a locker and this will ensure that as we uh, sign this, the lockers out that they are socially distanced. Um, Students have been able to carry their backpacks and they will continue to be able to carry their backpacks. We're working on those supply lists. I know that parents are anxious um, to get those supplies. And uh, one of the key pieces I think that will be different at PHS that we are very excited about is our students will be one-to-one -one and uh, meaning that they will be um, having their own assigned laptop, their own assigned district laptop. And fingers crossed, we will be ready to go with that coming right out the first day of school. So more information to come on that. Thank you, um, Leslie. So um, gives you a little bit of a snapshot of what our, our hybrid days will look like for students. Um, for students who have chosen the hybrid model attending two days, how will EMCC be incorporated into that schedule? Um, if you are um, already signed up for the EMCC program, this is high school students who go to Monroe and BOCES uh, for programs um, like the New Visions Health Program and, and others. Uh, we're working with uh, BOCES to ensure that the EMCC schedule is there. Uh, those programs are all still running. More information will come out to those students who are in the EMCC program. What times will my children need to be logged on on a computer on virtual days? Um, for for elementary, as we talked about, those days will be new instruction being provided by our literacy and math specialists and enrichment specialists. And so they'll, they'll have a schedule to log in. For middle school and high school, the home days, the virtual days are gonna be asynchronous for the most part. So students may not have to log in at a certain time, but they're gonna have assignments to do and they're gonna wanna log in and do that. And I know for, oh, go ahead, Dr. Maloney. And if I can, yeah. PHS. Um, we've actually looked at our schedule for the Wednesdays um, in terms of one of the pieces of feedback, and I think you mentioned this, Dr. Putnam, uh, during the closure was, how does my child get help? How do they access their teacher? When is their teacher available? Um, is their teacher available just during the regular school day. Um, so we've developed a schedule and it starts a little bit later because we know um, high schoolers sometimes sleep in. So um, starting at nine o'clock all the way up till I believe two or 2.30, students will be able to access teachers. Uh, there will be a schedule and uh, be able to log in and get that extra help and ask those questions uh, that they need pertaining to any of the instructional uh, components. Thank you. How's the school transitioning between classes and do these cohorts stay together in all classes at the high school? I think I can answer this one for both Bay Trail and the high school is that the students will still be moving class to class. It is not in the, in the size of our schools and the number of courses we offer. Uh, it is not at all feasible to have students stay in one room and the teachers move around to those classes. Um, it, is, it is something that if we could do, it would be great. But a great example is if you're in ninth grade and you're in global history, afterwards, you might not be going, not everybody might be going to English nine. They could be going to a different class. And so it's not feasible. So they will be transitioning, which is why we go back to our requirement mandate of masks all day. So there'll be masks in the hallways. 
the fact that we have a hybrid day to make sure our class size is small also will be a huge impact in our hallways with half as many students walking through the halls. And we're working on signage with our teams. And I would tell you that there is possible that some of the staircases might be up only or down only and how to walk in the hallway in terms of traffic patterns is being looked at to make sure that students um, are as social distant as possible in a hallway between classes. In the hybrid model on the days that will be virtual, what will the schedule be? Will they be working live with an active teacher? The answer is yes at K-5, and those, uh, those things will be taped, uh, video, uh, videoed, and so recorded, and then posted for students, our young ones who can't log on during the day because of daycare or parent work needs. Um, and at the uh, secondary level, um, besides Wednesday, where students can log on to see a teacher, their work will be asynchronous. They won't have to necessarily log on uh, during the day, but they will have work that needs to be done and completed. If we choose the hybrid model, do students still have the option of asynchronous learning for the virtual days? And the answer for the secondary is yes, because that is what the model uh, is set up to be. And at K-5, as I've said, we'll make sure that we're at the um, online learning, or sorry, the virtual synchronous learning is recorded so students will have access to it at a later time. We understand and heard from parents all through spring about that and we wanna make sure we build that in. Please give an example of asynchronous learning. Will there be asynchronous options for every day a child is not in school so I'm a teacher when I'm not working? Um, I'm gonna put Mr. Bunnington on the spot, but he's talked a lot about this. I know is, can you give just a brief example of what maybe an asynchronous history, English or math lesson would look like on those virtual days? So what I've been talking to the Bay Trail teachers about is um, they're planning asynchronous lessons for an English class, say they're planning asynchronous lessons every day um, because we know we're going to have either the a group or B group doing that asynchronous learning. They're going to be doing the same learning content, learning standards outcomes as the in-person group. We also wanna be prepared for a student that just happens to be sick for them to still have an asynchronous learning option that day. So what that'll look like is if you think about a regular lesson for a teacher where they're, they're starting with their introduction, explaining to the students, Here's what we're doing today. Here's our learning targets. Here's the goal. They may do some more direct teaching and explanation of the content and then give the students a learning task to do. We're giving the teachers the guidance. Those introductory video pieces will be the teacher either recording themselves in a video, like you see me now. It might be their voice on their PowerPoint presentation. And then, but that section would be about five or 10 minutes of instruction for the students, then we give the students a task to do. There may be a second video that's follow up to that. So they would see the teacher, the teacher would be giving that instruction for the asynchronous part along with the follow up. And there would also be something that they would be submitting um, back in teams to the, to the teacher to know that they've completed that. It might be anything from a simple check-in about what are two main points you learned from today's lesson. But so we have that, that verification that the student did complete that task. It may be actually completing and submitting the writing task for that day back to the teacher. So that's kind of a general model of how I'm talking to teachers at Bay Trail about what that asynchronous learning piece looks like. Thank you. Um, will they be switching classrooms to attend specials or will those te specific teachers come to the classroom? Uh, based on lots of reasons, even at K-5, our students will be going into the special area room like um, art or physical education in the gymnasium. It also helps, we do believe, with our social, emotional, and mental health of, of having students out of that one classroom for six hours a day. Are teachers allowed to work with small groups of students or will students be at their desks all day? As I mentioned, they won't be at their desk all day. They will be able to go to classes and, and move. We're gonna be encouraging teachers when possible to, to be outside if it works with their lesson, what they're doing, if it's quiet reading. Um, and then uh, teachers, it's gonna be different. The whole small group still has to be the six feet of social distancing. So it will look a little bit different uh, than if you walked in last September and saw groups, uh, students all packed together, um, that, that social distance has to be there. 
How will the resource room be managed? The resource room will be managed uh, both um, on, the, on the real days, on the in-person days. They'll be able to go to resource room and get support. And then virtually uh, we'll be working with those students as well. Uh, and again, that's a great question that specifically is around um, a student in a special program who has resource room on their IEP. And I encourage parents, you'll get the email um, tomorrow about the meetings for students with parents of students with disabilities to ask some very specific questions. Will kids be able to leave desk supplies in their desks at school or will those need to be brought home every day? This is a K-5 question and I'm gonna phone a friend to Mr. Nelson or Mr. Herscher raise his hand first. So if you could speak to that a little bit, I appreciate it. Sure thing. So I think all of us uh, as principals purchased bins for each of our students in cohorts A and B. So when cohort A is in, they're gonna keep their supplies within the desk in a bin. Also for cohort B, we're gonna be doing the same thing. So all they're gonna be bringing home is the materials they might need when they are virtual on the days that they're not in school, but they won't be sharing books, supplies, or anything of that matter. Thank you. I see the thumbs up from Mr. Nelson. So same across all of our elementary schools. What will be taught on the at-home days? Is it new material or just reinforcing the material from the in-school days? So I believe across that 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 at-home virtual days is not just review, but it will be continued work, new content. We know that in the spring, that's where we obviously in an emergency closure heard lots of that and tried to work through that, which remember the first couple of weeks for most districts was just review as we tried to transition. Um, now that we know we're in our planning for a hybrid day and a virtual day, we don't have time to, to just say the at-home days aren't instruction or new content. So it will be continued education and instruction on those virtual days. What's the plan to support these students that need support for the at-home learning days? This isn't perfect. We wanna be back to school. We don't want COVID to be here. We want five days a week. We want kids so we can work with them uh, closely all the time. This is the world we live in right now and hopefully is temporary, but we really encourage parents that if your child is struggling at home with those at-home learning days, that you please reach out to the classroom teacher, um, the counselor, the, the administrator to get support. We wanna know early and we'll do everything we can to support that child. We also know that because of COVID, we are in a world where one of our school board goals is partnerships. And we take the partnership with parents very seriously and appreciate it. And, and now more than ever, we need that partnership. And so uh, we know that. Um, but we will are working to make sure that the virtual days are much more scheduled. We'll be working with parents online to, to, to give you opportunities to learn how to use Teams and be able to sit down and help your child. Um, and then again, if, if you start to see struggles, please do not hesitate to reach out. Are both cohorts on the same academic schedule? This one, this question was specifically to high school, so I'll let Dr. Maloney answer it. Um, are both the cohorts A and B on the same academic schedule? So like, will they have exams on the same days, homework due the same time? And I could make up an answer, but I thought I'd, I thought I'd phone a friend, Dr. Maloney. Uh, with the phone a friend, don't you win a prize or something if you, ha if you answer the question correctly? And you get to plan reopening for COVID. That's your prize. So I, I think there's two pieces to this question, actually. Um, it's a yes and a no answer. So um, it, those of you that are familiar with the PHS schedule, we run a five-day schedule. So what will happen is the students who are in cohort A, um, they will have days one and two in person. And then um, the um, B students will have days one and two in person. So um, students will, so yes, the students are on the same academic schedule. Um, we are going to do our best to keep um, things together, but when we map out the entire year, um, there will probably be situations and times where exams, homework won't be at the same exact time, uh, won't be due or, or occur at the same exact time because of the cohorts and the way that they fall. Um, but yes, um, we're gonna try to keep that in terms of the, um, the in, 
um, in-person um, instruction. Thank you. Any more hybrid questions? If the district is able to instruct cohort A on Thursday, September 10th, and cohort B the next day, how come we can't do half days for all students five days per week? Great question. It is something that we really dug in and looked at doing half days for students. Um, ultimately, transportation does play a role in that. It's transporting basically uh, uh, twice as much because you got to bring everybody to school, bring them all home, bring the other half to school and bring everybody home. And um, that wasn't something that we could easily do. If we had parents driving, it might be possible. And at the end of the day, we really dug into some research around why we went um, half day K to full day K. And if you recall a few years back, I can tell you it was exactly, I think seven or eight years ago uh, when we shifted to full day K, um, the research all around the half day was the, the real limit to instructional time and what could happen. You heard from Mr. Nelson who talked about, you know, the teachers being excited and really looking at the potential of having students for, for, for you know, a long time because RTI is going to be provided virtually. And with a half day, by the time students get off the bus, come into school, take off their coat in their boots and shift into learning uh, mode, it is time to put on your coat, put on your boots and head back out to the bus. So we really looked at that a lot and ultimately decided that we that having kids two days a week and then really having a robust virtual plan uh, would be better academically. And I do know an area district that K-5 is doing um, half days um, and, um, um, you know, everything's a little bit different. And I know that no matter what we put out, some people will, it'll work. Other people, it will not work. We're doing our best to please as many as we can. And we appreciate again, that partnership and that support. Explain how cohorts were determined, where the cohorts broken up by neighborhood. Can we change cohorts? This is actually really exciting. I'll, I will take all my excitement and boil it down because how we learn to do this, we originally were going to do an alpha split for cohorts. And ultimately, when we do an alphabet split for our cohorts, it causes some different issues. It really um, broke students up in a way that maybe wasn't best for, for ethnicity, for gender, for, um, for lots of things. And so Infinite Campus, our student management tool that we use, came up with really at the last minute a way to break cohorts randomly by household. And so our number one variable was making sure that students in the same household, regardless of last name, if they lived in the same home, we wanted them to go to school on the same days for childcare support or consistency. And so that's how the cohorts were designed. They are randomized. They're not alpha, but household is the number one variable. They're not break, broken up by neighborhood. And trying to do that and break up and have a whole neighborhood go together, I did get a couple of requests for that. I can understand why it would be it would be easier in one sense, but I will be very honest. This district has always been very focused on equity and equality and making sure that the programs we put forth are truly equitable. To, to break up our cohorts by neighborhood really brings in an interesting question of haves and have-nots, and that's a worrisome for me as a superintendent and and as an educator. And so by doing neighborhood cohorts, we would be, we would ultimately be breaking people up by potentially their socioeconomic level. And so that wasn't something that we looked at. To be fair, we looked at it. The other piece is trying to do that because of the immense number of neighborhoods we have would be an absolutely daunting task that we couldn't get done in time. And so we instead used purely a randomized system through Infinite Campus. Can we change cohorts? This is the hardest part. Everybody I understand wants to change. If you feel like you have a need to change, you can email your building principal. We're keeping track of those changes. But as of now, I have to say, we're unable to make changes to those cohorts because every change has a reaction. If somebody wants to go from A to B because of social distancing, I need someone to go from B to A. And it has to be the same grade level, the same school, and, and we're not seeing those, uh, um, those um, requests lining up that way. So I've got to be fair that we will keep track of it. We will look at it as the year starts. We might be able to make some changes. We're going to keep monitoring that. But right now, like most of the districts around us, the cohorts have to be locked for a bit so we can build the schedule and try to get this year started off successfully. 
Why won't the children be allowed to play on the playground equipment during recess? Will there be other things for them to do? Um, we are gonna keep our elementary playgrounds closed um, for the beginning of the year, simply because of sanitation and we wanna be as cautious as possible. Uh, it is very fair that as things open up and we get into a routine, we'll be able to open up that playground equipment. We will not be able to sanitize it in between every single lunch, but if students use hand sanitizer before and after, um, and parents are okay with that, we should be able to open up. However, we have lots of great things for students to do. We have recess monitors, we're working on plans, so there'll be some organized play outside. Um, but right now, the beginning of the year, playgrounds are gonna be a no, but we will make that shift, we hope, as the school year starts. Will kids have access to lockers this year at Batreon PHS? We heard that answer. And what about physical education? Mr. Buddington or, or Dr. Maloney, will PE lockers be available, uh, Mr. Buddington? So, and I've talked with uh, Mary Beth Walker, who's our uh, director of, of or department chair of physical education. Um, and we're, at, we're not going to be utilizing the PE lockers. We're not gonna be requiring students to change for PE because there's a lot of issues, as you can imagine, to keep the distancing in the locker room. Um, is it's a, it's a much smaller space. So for PE, for physical education, we're not going to be require students to change. Locker rooms would still be available. Students need to use the restrooms, but not for changing for classes. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Maloney, any difference? No, actually uh, the same plan at PHS. I will say I give kudos to um, Mary Beth Walker, our K-12 department chair for PE. Um, she's got some, she's been working with the PE teachers. She's got some really cool ideas of some fun activities that can be social distanced um, and not require students to change. And um, I think PE students will probably see the, the least amount of um, change as opposed to um, some of the other courses. And thank you. Dr. Button, can I add one more thing? Absolutely. Um, just as we talk about physical education, the social distancing for physical, physical education, which is the same for band and chorus is 12 feet. So we're taking that into account for those students, whether they're playing an instrument, singing in chorus or doing physical activity. Thank you very much. Uh, where will kids eat lunch? This is really dependent on school. For example, Indian Landing is under full construction and they were already planning not to have a cafeteria and students will be eating in the classroom. I believe the same is true for um, looking at Mr. Herschler for Scribner, same with the construction. Um, in the Bay Trail in the high school, they are utilizing their cafeterias as we heard about earlier. And I have Mr. Nelson here. Is it classroom or cafeteria at Harris Hill, Mr. Nelson? We're gonna use our, our cafeteria. We can put everybody in there. Thank you, and be socially distant in the cafeteria? Yep. And I believe that's the same I heard for at least some classes at Cobbles. That's so correct, Dr. Using... Putnam. We're oh. using our cafeteria as well. Thank you, I didn't see you on there, Dr. Kenny. I apologize. I'll make sure the next elementary question will go to you. I won't pick on Mr. Nelson and uh, Mr. Herschler. So, Will my child be allowed to bring their lunch? Absolutely, I would encourage it. Our cafeteria plans are being made. And I will say that uh, Mr. Argento presented at the um, a board meeting this last Tuesday. He's our director of food service. We will be providing a hot lunch and a, a cold option every day, but the choices are gonna be limited. In order to stop uh, students congregating around certain things like the snack machines at the high school, the vending machines are out. They won't even be in the cafeteria and commons. And at the middle school, the little, little snack area where uh, slushies are really important, they will not be sold. We won't have um, as much snack choice. We will offer a hot lunch and a cold lunch, um, but options are gonna be more limited. Um, so you can absolutely still buy a lunch. That's wonderful. Uh, we utilize that quite a lot and will utilize it this year, I'm sure. Um, but you can absolutely bring your own lunch. General reopening questions. We're gonna wrap this up soon. And then I've got questions that people have been sharing through the online um, form and we appreciate that. How will PE take place uh, both 100% virtual and hybrid? And so if you're 100% virtual, your PE lessons will obviously be 100% virtual. We'll plan for that, but they will most likely be asynchronous. 
um, in the hybrid, as uh, Mr. Bunnington and Dr. Maloney mentioned, and the um, elementary principals, it runs like a regular day, and then there could be some asynchronous options as well. Uh, labs, really, we focus here on our science labs for uh, Bay Trail students, especially taking living environment in eighth grade and our high school science. Could Mr. Bunnington or Dr. Maloney mention, have you had the conversation on how labs would work in a virtual world? I'll, I'll start first and Dr. Maloney can add to it. Um, so we're working with our science teachers. The state has given us some uh, guidance and flexibility regarding labs and virtual labs. We still will be completing labs, but they will take both formats. So. Um, our teachers will be in person for hybrid. They will be doing labs in person. And the students taking the living environment class at Bay Trail will still be completing virtual labs at home. The state has given us guidance on what those look like. It might be using uh, simulation programs. It might be given a set of data and still have to do the analysis of that data and what that data means in the lab right up in the application of the science concepts. But we will be doing both labs for both groups of kids. Thank you. How will grading and feedback on assignments take place? Very different than the spring emergency closures. Um, our grading and feedback is going to look very similar like a traditional year. Students will be assigned work. Students will have to hand that in either in person or online via Teams. Um, and that work will be, will be assessed by the teacher, feedback provided, grades given. And at the end of the first quarter, uh, students will have a, a grade that would go in uh, to the report card. Unlike in, in spring with the emergency closer, closures where we had more of a, a, of a pass or, or um, um, wasn't incomplete, but it was pass and pass and maybe incomplete. I can't remember right now. I apologize. I try to put spring out of mind as much as I possible as we look forward to September. Um, but grading will be much more traditional and, and important for students to know that there is a, a true expectation if, 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 in order to pass those classes and complete the work they need to, to do it and hand it in. Will attendance take place? Absolutely. I mentioned in real class, we will take attendance traditionally and then through Microsoft Teams, our platform, when students log in, there will be a way uh, that we are going to be able to take attendance for those students. For both models, what is the instructional plan for children with IEPs that do not fall within the 1211 or 12131 identified plans? And that really is specific to your child's IEP. And also I'll say if your child has a 504 plan. And so you're gonna work with the special education administrator. We will make sure that the IEP is followed and that students get the support that they require and, and need. Um, so those specific questions about your individual child, please don't hesitate to reach out to your building's uh, uh, special education administrator and also look for an email tomorrow um, with dates for meetings next week via Zoom. How will music course lessons take place? Um, we've talked about this a little bit. So at the K-5, music will be and lessons will be all virtual. Um, there's not the space we need to run those large groups with 12 feet of distance between them. Um, same with lessons at the high school in Bay Trail. There'll be virtual lessons, but possibly the opportunity of bringing the, the groups together um, in certain areas. More of that will come, but we're dedicated to doing the best we can. How will we get our students schedules? When will we get our students schedules? This is where I'm gonna need lots and lots of patience. And I know it's tough because this is the time of year where letters go home and kids find out their teacher and they're excited. And, and high school and middle school students get the schedule, but we're gonna need as much time as possible to build these so the first time we put them out, we know that they're right. The last thing we wanna do is send out schedules now and then a week later say, oh, I'm sorry, we have to change that schedule. So please be patient, we will get them out, we will communicate via email when those are being sent out or when you can see them on Infinite Campus. Will school supply list be modified? Will it be the same for both hybrid and virtual learners? Great question. We're building those supply lists now. Bay Trail supply list is out. It went out yesterday if you have a middle school student. And the answer there would be absolutely. It was very modified, far less to need on this, that school supply list. I know K-5 and high school are working on that as well. So please stay tuned. How will the district work with Urban Suburban Program and the students to ensure their academic, social, emotional needs are met? 
I love this question. I'm a strong supporter, as is our Board of Education with the Urban Suburban Program. They are Penfield students through and through, so they have access to everything our Penfield students um, need. So they get the choice of virtual or hybrid. They get, uh, if they are in need of a piece of uh, a device, a laptop, we will make sure that they have one. And, and we will work with those students and their families closely like, like we do with all Penfield families to make sure they're supported. Are there options for childcare through the YMCA on the virtual days? Do you know if Penfield will be partnering with the Penfield Rec offering a full day program to its community for the days the kids will not be in school? There is gonna be at our K-5 buildings before and after care with the YMCA. They were able to submit a plan that meets all of the requirements to do so with masking and social distancing. And speaking with the YMCA, they are going to be putting something out um, for those virtual days where they're going to be able to run basically a program where students will have access to technology and Wi-Fi and tutoring support to get work done for families who are able to do that. We right now don't have a partnership with the Penfield Recreation. I saw this question come in. I think it's great. We'll reach out to them. But as of right now, there's no program set up through Penville Rec, there is one through the YMCA, just like before and after care, there is a cost to that. Um, and, and families would have to work with the YMCA specifically, but they are a strong partner with us. If my child chooses hybrid and wants to switch to virtual or vice versa, is that possible? So I'll be honest, most districts around us are saying, whatever you choose on your survey, that is a 100%, you have to stay there for the first semester. We are saying the same thing but we also understand that there are issues that come up and, and circumstances that happen. So if your child chooses hybrid or virtual and you need to change to the other model, what I'll ask you to do is reach out to your building principal. But I also have to be honest is I can't make a guarantee that it will happen overnight because of the staffing ratios. The, the, because we will have virt teachers teaching virtually kids, we can't add 100 students overnight if they all wanna go virtual. And same, if 100 virtual kids wanna come into hybrid, that will throw off our social distance requirement. So it will take time to make that change. We're asking people by this Sunday to please make the decision that works best for you and your family and your child, um, but ultimately know that we will definitely take requests, but we cannot guarantee that it can be a shift immediately. I hear that question. We all hear that question. We understand it. I want to start hybrid, but if cases start to spike, I want to immediately go to virtual. It can't be immediate. It's kind of like your schedule at Bay Trail or high school. Once that schedule is built, if you want to schedule change, we'll work with you, but we can't guarantee it can happen overnight because of all the other variables that are there. I know that I would love to be able to say no problem. You can switch back and forth but ultimately we don't know how many are gonna be in each group and we can't make that promise right now. So please uh, think through, make sure you make the choice that you think you can live with for the first semester. And then again, we will uh, have an opportunity to shift come second semester. Uh, do you have any concerns over the teachers union calling for 100% remote learning or a delayed start to in-person instruction? Are you prepared to execute a plan for 100% remote um, in day one? This is an interesting question and I think it's important. Uh, all of our collective bargaining groups, our unions in this district are incredible partners. They, we've worked with them through this process. Um, the representatives from each union were at our, one of our reopening task force meetings. And so right now I, am not, I don't have concerns that any of our unions or teachers are gonna be calling for remote learning or, or, or delayed start more than what we've already done of pushing for the first day to September 10th. But I want to be fair that every single person that works for Penfield, we have just under a thousand staff members. They are human beings just like everybody who sends their kids to school. So they also have potentially different levels of concern and anxiety about starting school back up in person. We can't offer them a 100% virtual model because we need them in the building to teach and to support our students. But that anxiety level is real regardless of what your role is in this community. We understand that. That level of anxiety is a continuum. Some people are at the, I don't worry at all about COVID and others are at the, I'm very, very worried. And then everybody in between. And so I would just say that we're working as close as we can with all of our groups and, and really the, the support is there. Um, teachers want kids back to school. Nobody got into teaching to only teach virtual. 
And so we're working the best we can to make sure that we are being um, transparent, that we're working with them, we're talking about options, but at the end of the day, we are ready to go for a hybrid and virtual model. We, we still got a little work to do, but by September 10th, we will be 100% ready to go. And I do mention that because just today, a number of schools around the state are announcing that they're going 100% virtual for a number of reasons. Right now, we're not. We're, we're still committed to the two plans we have of hybrid and virtual. And so it's my shout out and thank you to all of our staff who've continued to work. And again, anxiety is real, different health reasons are real, um, but it's a great place to work and send your children. That's as a superintendent and a parent. Will there be any kind of orientation done for kindergartners, sixth graders, ninth graders? Um, I'm gonna answer this just for time, but the answer actually is yes. And you're gonna hear some information from the building principals uh, as we move forward. It won't be a traditional orientation, but we're committed to getting our, our kindergartner students into the building before the first day of school so they can see the classroom meet their teacher. For uh, sixth grade and ninth grade, it may not be time to come in and meet your teacher, but definitely time to be able to get in the building, walk your schedule. If you don't have your schedule, at, at least walk around to see where the A classrooms are, B and C for the houses at Bay Trail, and see where the different um, areas are at the high school. So we've heard that loud and clear. We're working very hard to have a, a plan in place, but it won't be a traditional orientation where we bring 400 kids into auditorium and put them next to each other to talk about. So more to come on that, but yes, if you have anxiety about sending your child in this transition of K, sixth grade or ninth grade, we're working through that now. Will there be assessments done for kindergartens? Yes, there will. That kindergarten assessment will still take place as we start school. We're using social distancing, masking, and all of the protocols. Will students be able to participate in sports clubs and extracurricular activities? As of right now, uh, athletics in New York State are on hold, so there are no athletics. But for clubs and extracurriculars, we are going to be putting out to our staff a opportunity to uh, propose that their club or extracurricular can run virtually. And if it can run virtually in a synchronous setting, we might be able to do that. And we are committed to that social emotional uh, health of our students. And that means uh, participating in extracurriculars, but they wouldn't take place after school like they did last year. It would be in the virtual world and we are hopeful that we'll be able to offer some great things. If things open up after the year, just like playgrounds, if things uh, go well and we're able to get into a routine and the COVID numbers are, are staying where they are or going down, then our hope is that we can obviously start the late bus runs and do some more um, extracurricular activities in school. But just like playgrounds, our approach in the beginning of the year is gonna be very cautious. Technology, will laptops be provided for all Penfield students? And the answer is yes, but. The answer is yes, we are already uh, signed up to be a one-to-one -one district and we will be rolling out computers or devices to every kindergartner through 12th grader. But we don't have that shipment in yet. And it was a large shipment to do that, to move to 100% virtual. Dr. Maloney mentioned that the um, our plan right now, I'll be honest, is we hope that we can provide a device to every eighth grader through 12th grader to start the school year with. But on our survey, we asked people if they really need a device to start the school year. And so based on those numbers, we might have to shift what we're doing with eighth through 12th. We're going to have to look through that. So we're really asking when you fill out that survey, do you have a device at home that can get you through the first month, month and a half of school? We're pretty confident by mid-October, we will be able to hand out a device to every child in Penfield, like our plan is, but there are supply chain delays um, because not just Penfield, but every school district in America decided to buy computers after they had to shut down. So we're there. And we just ask if you can get through the first month and a half, great. But if you really truly need one, please let us know. And, and that's what our goal is. Uh, when would you expect to receive those so we can plan? I mentioned we're, we're hopeful right now. I talked to our director of technology and we're thinking uh, at, at the latest, it would be mid-October. We're hoping for earlier. How does the district handle two students who need to sign on at the same time on one computer? If you're at home and you have two children and only one computer, I'd ask you to, if you can't find another device to use for the short term, please 
make sure you note that you need a device on our survey because we are going to be doing more, um, um, especially K-5 synchronous work. And uh, if you've got the high school, middle school, we understand that need. If you need one, put it in. We're going to do everything we can to get you a device. What technology should we have at home? Chromebooks, which laptop, et cetera? Um, the answer is just about everything works. But if you want to know what we're going to be handing out is Lenet uh, Lenevo, Lenevo's or Dell uh, with Pentium processors, Windows 10 operation. So if you if you have those minimums, you should be okay. Uh, if you have a Mac or an iPhone or some an iPad, there is an app uh, through iOS that you can download Microsoft 365, which is the platform we're using. And I do, it actually works pretty well. It doesn't have all the functions, but it works just fine for everything we have to do for school. Will all the work be done in Teams and not be printed out and then scanned in? Everything is going to be done on Teams. Unlike September, we're making a very clear expectation that parents will not have to print anything from their home printers. Because we'll have staff in buildings, if there's a packet that needs to go home, kids will be able to bring it home when they're in school real, we'll be able to deliver it or send it to the virtual students. Will all teachers use the same platform for assignments? And yes, the platform is Microsoft Teams. Uh, that is what you can plan for. Has proper trainer training be given to teachers to teach in the virtual world? What makes you confident that teachers will be successful with a virtual environment? Yes, we've done PD and training all summer long online, some in person. Because we were able to push the school year back, we have six full days with our staff that do additional PD and training. I'm confident that we'll be successful because I absolutely believe Penfield can do it best. And we have incredible staff, regardless of what your title is here in Penfield. And uh, I'm very confident that we will make, uh, we will make some very, very sweet lemonade out of the lemons that we are dealt with COVID. Will each student get login credentials prior to the first day? Yes, but they can actually log in right now to Microsoft Teams. If they know how to log into the computer when they're in school, they can log in. But for our newer students or people who forgot how to log in, um, we'll share that or you can reach out, I believe to your building principal um, and we, we can find a way if your child can't log in. My guess is if you ask your child, they know how to log in because they did it all last spring. Will classrooms be equipped with a camera for live streaming? No, they won't. And we really looked at the technology here, trying to film teachers teaching and trying to engage students at home is not something that, that we see working well and being able to stand behind a strong instruction. So there won't be cameras in the classrooms. This is time for new questions and answers. This is very exciting because those of you at home who have been putting in questions, we're seeing them real time as they come up. I'm gonna go through and just read these out. I'll, I won't ask the ones that, um, I won't ask the ones that um, were asked already. And what I will just mention is we've got 10 more minutes. We're gonna to stick to this time. This is the first time we did this. We're gonna do this again at uh, seven to 9 p.m. It will be a similar format. We're gonna go through all those same questions. I think the second time we might be able to move a little bit quicker. Um, and if your question wasn't answered, um, and you sent it in and you put your email address in there, uh, like it asked, we'll have your email address because uh, Mr. Renner at the town of Penfield is gonna archive this and I'll have all the questions and names. So we'll do our best to reach out and answer your questions. Um, what is the deciding factor for moving the entire school district to an all virtual model, says Jennifer from Penfield. And the answer is, uh, it really is gonna be the Monroe County Department of Health or the governor. So if the governor says you all have to close like happened in the spring, I don't have a choice. We have to close and go fully virtual. Or if the Monroe County Department of Health says that our numbers have exceeded a 9% average of new cases, we will also have to close. And that's based on the governor's language and the Department of Health. Do kids need to bring in a laptop for in-person work or can they stay home? Right now, because we are not giving out one-to-one -one devices to every student, I would not. we are not saying that your child has to bring their laptop from home, their personal device in. Once we get into the one-to-one -one world, then yes, it will be like sort of their notebook. They'll move it back and forth from home and school, says Alicia from Penfield. Um, oh, if, if what happens if a district is shut down district-wide? 
what will happen. Our plan right now, as of today, just to let you know what our plan is that if we have to close immediately, is that we will keep the hybrid in place. So, so students would get two days of instruction on a live Zoom or team with their teacher and then three days asynchronous work. That might shift into a fact that they're getting five days of synchronous work with their teacher. It's possible. But in order to know that we have a plan that we can implement immediately, we will, not, we will keep the hybrid plan, but turn it into a fully virtual plan. We'll keep the hybrid schedule, but do it fully virtual. I will be honest, we're gonna be monitoring that, but what we learned in spring is we wanna be able to say very clearly, this is our plan if we have to close, and then our goal would be to get more synchronous time with our students uh, via Zoom and Teams. Uh, will the curriculum material be made available to parents for reinforcing materials presented in class? I would say yes through Teams. So we're gonna be able to show you how to access Teams. I can't build you a Penfield Teams account, but I can uh, have you work with your child to log into their account and see all of the assignments and work that is there. Will there be January Regents exams? If I was the governor, there wouldn't be January Regents exams, but I'm not. So right now, New York State Education Department has not changed the three through eight testing or the Regents exams. Those are all still in place. We are monitoring closely. If there is a change, you will definitely hear it from us. And I will just let you know that uh, my recommendation and my advocacy to Albany is that we cancel state tests three through eight and Regents for this year and next year. I don't think it's fair to test students when we're trying to do virtual and hybrid and trying to work through this. So that is our advocacy to Albany, um, but we don't have the power to make that change. Will there be supply drop off teacher meet and greet something for the kids to be able to do um, before school starts? My understanding, elementary principals can correct me, is that we are gonna be doing supply drop off, but it will probably be like in the bus loop where they drive up and drop off. Does that sound fair? Is that what we, nope, Scott's telling me no, good. But we are doing it only for kindergarten students. We're gonna socially distance and stagger it so that students can come in with a parent and meet the teacher, see the classroom setting, and that will be that. Thank you. Um, can kids have their own bottle of hand sanitizer on their desk? It's a question I haven't gotten before. I'm gonna say yes. If a child does have their own hand sanitizer, I think that's okay. And we'll have it all over the building as well. Um, if the entire K-5 class, or I can exp expand, ex uh, expand this, if an entire class of students and teacher have to be quarantined because of a positive test how, uh, of COVID, how do they learn? And we're working through that with sort of the staffing side of it, but the goal would be if the entire third grade class, including the teacher, is quarantined by the Department of Health for two weeks, but the teacher is well, they just have to quarantine, they're not the positive test, that we would hope we'll be able to find a plan that the teacher can keep teaching in a virtual world. So when they would be logging on to Zoom or Teams to meet with the class. Our goal is gonna be if and when we have to quarantine a class of students that, that the instruction will continue. And we do believe we'll be able to do that. Um, when and if that happens, we will be sharing exactly what the schedule would be. Will the high school seniors be leaving the school for open lunch? And because the concern is that this adds contacts and possible exposures to the school day. We did talk through this, uh, Dr. Maloney and I, as well as getting some recommendations from health officials. We are gonna leave our open lunch open right now. That's just for seniors who have the privilege of, of going out to lunch and they have got to come back. It does open up for um, exposures, but we also know that once students leave our building, we have no control of where they go for exposures. If there was a positive COVID test, the Department of Health is doing contract, um, contact um, tracing. The same would be that if a parent needs to pick up their child for a doctor's appointment or anything like that, they're also leaving the building and then coming back to the building. So when we talk about everything COVID, it's very fair to say, we are not eliminating risk. We're mitigating risk to try to make it as less as possible. But with everything we do, we know it can't be 100% COVID free. 
Um, but that's our answer now. And with everything, including playgrounds, that might change um, as we get into the year and we will update uh, students and families for any change that happens. Will the windows at the building and on the bus need to be open at all times? Uh, the bus windows, I believe that regulation is that they are open at all times. So bus windows will be, and we'll be encouraging, as um, Mr. McNiff mentioned earlier, we're going to be exchanging the air a lot more rapidly and changing our filters uh, routinely in a, in, a, in, a, in a different way more. Um, and with the windows, yes, teachers can open their windows, especially in our buildings that don't have air conditioning. Um, um, but the one thing is this question also references fans. Uh, we can't use fans unless the fans are pointing out the window. And that's from the Department of Health is when you have a fan blowing the air all around, it, it doesn't help with, um, with trying to mitigate that risk of COVID. But windows can be open. Uh, will we be allowed to carpool with other families as desire to allow students and working parents to not have to take the bus? Yes. So um, we, we will work with your children the minute they show up and the minute they leave. But as a parent, if you need to carpool, that is your decision. Um, honestly, we can't police carpooling. So if a family needs to drive together, um, as long as you're taking the precautions, we hope you are, you are able to carpool. How will we do lockout and lockdown drills? How will they be handled? It's a great question. And actually, Mr. Fox is our um, uh, uh, security and preparedness manager. And the state did make a little bit of a change. We still have to do all of our fire drills. We still have to do all of our lockdown drills. But they did allow us to say that during a lockdown drill, when students typically have to crowd into a small space, they don't have to do that. It would just be the teacher saying, if this was a real lockdown, we would have to be um, uh, smushed in a small space. But they don't have to do that for the drill which I think is, is helpful. Um, we do have a few more questions. A lot of them are things that were already covered. Apologize for the, for the quietness here as I look through, making sure we get as many. Oh, uh, this is a great question. Why can't the construction be accelerated or is it already? So the construction of the new classrooms, it actually is ahead of schedule because when we had the COVID closing, construction was considered an essential business and they were able to keep building. But just like building your house, if you're building your own house, you can't go out and tell the construction crew, I know I told you six months, but I'd like it done in a week. Um, so that is not possible. They're all bid out, they're working, uh, they're working multiple shifts in their building, but unfortunately it is good to know that they are well ahead of schedule, um, but we can't accelerate that any faster. So it is 4.59, uh, we will archive these questions. We will get them out to uh, um, the team and we'll do our very best to reach out. If you don't hear from us, don't hesitate to, to send a question to your building principal or administrator or to me and we'll continue to uh, update our form. So I appreciate everybody being here. I know we did not get to every question that was asked, but a lot of them are, are repeated questions. And again, if you really have a, a question, you can watch the next two um, meetings and ask your questions there too, or you can email your building principal or administrator or my office, and we will do our best to get you all the answers. We are also updating our FAQ. It will be up, updated again next week. Um, we're just having a minor issue, but we're adding changes and that will be updated on Monday, I believe of next week with lots more questions, many that you have asked here. So now it's five, I appreciate. In closing, I just want to say again, a thank you and know that we have two other community meetings and um, really at the end of the day, this is a true partnership. There is nothing we can do to make uh, the COVID reality go away right now. We are going to follow all of the required mandates from the state and local Department of Health, as well as New York State Education and the governor's office. I appreciate greatly working with this team of administrators and Board of Education members, as well as all of our staff across this district um, are working to make sure that what we create come September is safe, sound, and also academically and social emotionally focused. So thank you very much. I know this isn't what anybody wants, but I appreciate um, the ability of this community to hopefully come together and, and, and build something that works the best it can for our students in a COVID world. So thank you very much. We're gonna sign off now. Um, have a great evening.